What's up everybody, it's Chelsea here. Um, today I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of insight on the history of my driving. I've seen a lot of comments on like, oh, I'm so glad you're finally an FD, things like that, which I've been driving FD for a while. Um, and then a bunch of different comments that kind of were like, oh, maybe people just don't know I've been doing this for half my life and uh, do a little bit of education on that. So a first order of business is just got these Stancer Dancer slap stickers. They're pretty sweet, uh, pretty high quality, no paper bullshit there. Um, you can pick them up on the website. They're five bucks, chelseadenofa.com. Uh, include shipping. Really cool thing about this is it's a take a chance for taking a chance. So each one of these that you buy will be entered into a uh, smaller pool of uh, that will get picked uh, a winner. We'll pick a winner uh, every Thursday and Monday. Um, so... If you buy a sticker, we'll pick a winner that will get an entry into Win the Stancer Dancer. So basically, buy a sticker, each one you get will be put into a hat, we'll pick a winner, and out of that, they will get an entry to the Stancer Dancer contest. So it's like a contest before a contest. Um, but really, it's just slap sticker, uh, five bucks shipped. It's cheaper than most of people out there um, to support the channel and support the Stancer Dancer um, obviously we use all this budget to be able to make more content for you guys. This stuff is expensive. I lose money doing all this YouTube stuff. I literally do not make anything. Um, so putting that towards doing some more cool content and creation and hopefully being able to get Tanner to each of the FD rounds and then have, uh, Chelsea shoot some stuff overseas. Uh, hopefully we can get, uh, some cool content for you guys. But, uh, moving forward to the point of this video was, uh, so I've been driving for 15 years almost. I think it's 15 years in May of this year. Um, it's half my life. And uh, it's been crazy. I started off in 2003 with an S13. It was automatic. Um, and I drove some events at Hialeah Speedway in South Florida because that's where I was growing up when I got my driver's license and my permit. Uh, my first events, my mom actually had to drive my car to the event for me. And then I could drive because I wasn't old enough to actually drive the car. Um, but I picked up a thousand dollar S13. It was, had 28,000 original miles on it. It was super, super, super clean and I pretty much destroyed it. Um, so nowadays people would look at me and want to kill me for that. Um, but it was back then nobody was drifting. Nobody had any idea. It was just an automatic four cylinder car that was sort of sporty looking. Um, <clears throat> so I got rid of that and I got an FCRX7 and I did some street sliding with that and kind of figured out how to drive. Got a little bit into suspension stuff because it came with some adjustable shocks and stuff. It was just an S5 NA FC. Really cool car. I still like those today. Um, in 2004 was the Falcon Tire Drift Show Off. That was my first big event I'd ever gone to. Uh, we were driving the automatic S13. Um, Vaughn Gittin was there, Calvin Wan was there, a bunch of FD guys that are driving now were there. Um, if you could link that track, you were like a hero, so it was pretty neat. Uh, back then, no one really was all that great. Everybody was just, if you could link a track, you were pretty much a pro driver at that point. Um, in 2005, I drove, I built a Miata that was NA in the beginning, and I drove that at uh, Hialeah Speedway, um, at OSW, and halfway through 2005, I turboed the car and made about 240 horsepower on a Gretty kit that was like 16 pounds of boost, race gas. It was like crazy. That was insanely fast back then. It was also one of the first cars to have modified knuckles, so it had good steering angle. No one really had been doing that yet. Um, so it's kind of inter interesting, but no major events. A couple little small competitions at OSW, uh, which is now where we drive FD now, which is 13 years later. Um, so that's been in the history of drifting for a long time. Um, so nothing huge went on that year. Um, in 2006, I took my first trip outside of, um, oops, someone's at the door. Um, hang on one second. Is there glass in there? It's a phone case, I thought. And my screen protectors. Oh, whoops. Sorry, mailman was there. Wanted to make sure we got the package. Um, so yeah, 2006, first time I left Florida to go drifting. Um, we went to Houston for FD Qualifier. That's the first time I met Aaron Losey and those guys from Lone Star Drift. 
Uh, so that was 2006, 12 years ago, FD qualifier. I did not get a license, but I did get to drive with some good people, have a good time. Afterwards, we went to this place called No Problems Raceway. I ended up getting second place to Aaron. He won. Um, and I was so broke that I had to ask him for his winnings to make it home. <laughs> and he told me, nah, man, get your own money. But he ended up helping me out to get home because I needed to win that event to be able to pay the guys from Florida that towed me up there, uh, Sean Love from SOR. Um, this, I mean, it goes way back, you know, we were the Turtec guys with BMW stuff, uh, which is later the reason why I built my BMW. <clears throat> so we're really at the roots of everything at this point. First time competing, first time out of the country. I had to like skip school to go to the event. Um, so it was pretty neat. Uh, then in 2007, um, they had a D1 uh, USA, D1 GP USA event at Englishtown. I went to that, I qualified, and my throttle body broke right before um, the second run of qualifying. So we zip-tied the throttle body wide open, and I drove the car by clicking the key on and off. <laughs> so you'd turn the key on, it would be full power. If you needed to modulate it, you'd turn the key off. I was able to link the track and do pretty decent, and I went into my tandem battle like that. Like, they actually let me drive. It was crazy. Um, and I lost my tandem battle because I made a mistake. Um, could be because of the key or whatever, but Vaughn was at that event as well. He had to borrow a Corolla with an SR20 from one of his buddies. Um, so pretty neat event. Everybody was there. Anyone who was anyone was going to be at that event. And this is kind of the start of the explosion of drifting in general. Um, later they had D1 Japan versus USA, uh, event. Um, so, and Vaughn ended up winning that. And this was kind of like, really like, that's the first event I think that packed the stands at Irwindale. So, Starting to get pretty big. In 2007, they had the start of Nopi Drift, um, which was a Tuner Vision series that had a TV show on uh, Speed Vision and had a bunch of coverage. It was a big series, 50,000 plus people at each event. Pretty wild. Um, I didn't do t too great in that. Um, I ended up like mid-pack pretty much every event. I qualified first place, I think, in, in a Miami event that they had there. Um, it was a really tight technical track. My Miata had an advantage there. Um, so from there, uh, I went into 2008 with a BMW, and in 2008, we put together an E36. We took the season off, pretty much, so we could build this E36, and by building back then, it was like strip the interior, put a cage in it, turbo it, make a little bit of power. I think it was about 420 or 440 horsepower, but that was my street car. I really only had one car back then. Like I had my truck that I towed with, but I drove that the E36 on the street all the time, um, so I delivered pizzas in it and drove it back and forth to work and whatnot. So pretty interesting. Um, so 2008 Nopi, I only drove two events. I ended up doing well, like top eight on both of them, decent qualifying, but was still trying to learn the car. Didn't know much about it. I didn't have steering angle or anything yet on that particular car. Um, so in 2009, D1 GP USA ran a full season. So when I heard that was happening, I put some time and effort into the car Got some knuckles done for it, um, the custom stuff, just by extending the lower control arm from the factory and some other little things, and working with started working with Sean at SLR to start building a kit that was going to be bolt-on, ready to go, and, and rip. So uh, we drove D1 GP USA. I ended up being one of the top American drivers in the series. They had Daigo Saito. They had Nomukin. Um, they had... A bunch of different FD guys, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, D1 GP guys were there. Um, so really, really stiff competition. The J guys pretty much destroyed us. Uh, there was only a few events where the American guys actually shined. Um, but I ended up being one of the top American drivers there, and I won a trip to Japan to go over there and drive with them. So that was really, really cool. Um, so in two, at the end of 2009, I went for my Formula D license at what was called Formula D's uh, Pro-Am Nationals, which was how you got a license for the following year every year back then because there was no Pro 2 or anything or no feeder series. So I showed up with it there with my turbo BMW, um, did pretty well, ended up getting second place, I believe. It might have been third, but I think it was second. I know Mike Pollard beat me, so I definitely didn't get first. Um, but either way, um, ended up getting my FD license 2009, didn't use it until um, later, and I'll explain that, but never really had the budget to drive, and I didn't want to go into FD not doing well and being broke and maxing credit cards out and stuff. So, D1 GP folded, got nasty, it wasn't very good, a bunch of people got owed everybody money, and it just didn't work out. So, 
This new series called XDC, which is Extreme Drift Championship, um, they started in 2010. And they've been a big push. We had a lot of people at the events. Uh, the first event was um, was pretty much sold out. Uh, so it was pretty neat. I had built, uh, I turned the car up a little bit, 500 horsepower. We were on Nexon tires at this point, so 275s, already running pretty low pressures. Starting to learn a little bit about grip and how having a car that was faster than everybody else's gave you a huge advantage. Um, so back then, nobody knew that. You know, it was like people were still figuring that out. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. I'm looking at these FD cars that are on 315s that weigh 2,500 pounds. Why? And then I start gripping my car up and figuring out how to. And then boom. So in 2010, I ended up winning the XDC championship. I would not have won the championship if the guy who was leading the championship didn't blow a motor and didn't show up at the last round. Um, but at the last round, it had finally clicked like halfway through that year on how to tandem and kill it. Um, so halfway through the year, I had figured, oh, like, <clears throat> if the person in front of me, if and if I'm going the same speed as the person in front of me, and I'm inches from them, if I hit them, it can't, I can't, can't hit them very hard. But if I'm far away, and I hit them, I'm going to be coming in with speed and actually smash them. So I was like, I just need to be on everyone's door the entire time. So once that clicked in my head, seven years after I started driving... Um, my tandem abilities just kind of skyrocketed from there. So I ended up winning the F XDC championship in 2010. Then in 2011, we ran XDC again, um, and I won a championship with that. We had built a new car because we realized that the green car at the time, the coupe that I bought, was getting pretty hammered. I really wanted to build a sedan, and I had some partners involved that were going to help me build the car. So we built a 2,400-pound turbo E36, super, super lightweight. Um... And it made about 500, 550 horsepower. Same motor from the previous car. Um, just turned up a little bit. A uh, different turbo and whatnot. So it's pretty neat. Um, so we ended up winning a championship with that. And XDC had a lot of FD drivers that drove. So most events had three to five FD drivers that would show up and drive XDC. So pretty interesting. A lot of good competition. But I ended up pushing 2011. I pretty much podiumed every event. Um, besides F or besides PGP in Seattle. I had a wastegate fail and get stuck open, made no boost, and ended up losing because of it. Corey Hosford beat me. So I'm sure you guys know him from Driftcast. Uh, so yeah, going into 20 or 2012, I know that I won both championships of the other series in the U.S., and I was like, I got to make the steps into FD. So BC and a couple of my other partners were finally like, let's do this, let's make a push. Um, BC made a huge push. <clears throat> helped me big time with that and I stepped into FD in my first season with the E36 turned up to about 700 horsepower I was super familiar with the car this was the first car that I actually had a pro, uh, actual production SLR kit on so the same kit you can buy today um, with some modifications it wasn't as as good back then but it was it was really the top of the game back then for what we were doing um so I finished top eight at Palm Beach that year. I had a fifth place qualifier, which wasn't bad. I ended up pretty much being rookie of the year, um, but Daigo Saito took that from me. <laughs> he won the championship, and they considered him a rookie. So not only did he win the championship, but he won rookie of the year. But I was like 100 points ahead of the next rookie of the year. So I felt pretty confident in that. Moving into 2013, um, or actually, sorry, at the end of 2012, I switched, I crashed the E36 really, really bad, stuffed the front end in, and I switched over to an RX-8 running with Ron Bergenholtz from Bergenholtz Racing, um, factory-backed Mazda team. Really, really great guys. Ron's one of my best friends now to this day. Um, it was a great opportunity because I brought my old team from the, the BMW into the RX-8 and the Mazda so they could see how a professional race team was run. Um, it was pretty neat. I was excited about it. I got to drive three rounds in that car. They really kind of picked me up at a point where I was, like, totally screwed. I was trying to put a car together in, like, two weeks to make Seattle, and they flew me out to test the car, and they loved it. They said that I was driving it really well, and they wanted me to finish the season. So uh, that was a bummer that I had to boot Ju uh, June Mang out of the car, but they really were going to do it regardless. So I jumped in. I drove the car for the last three rounds. I uh, top 16 in the car, qualified decent. We really started working in that car and getting it really good. Uh, but for 2013, they didn't have the budget to run, and Ron was doing some personal things, so it was no big deal. We finished up the E46 that we were building that was very, very similar to the E36, um, but just a couple things changed. 
and uh, got the E46 together for Long Beach. We showed up with that car fresh for Long Beach, ended up getting fourth place there. Um, so we were pretty stoked on that. We started really, really dialing in the suspension of the car, making it run right. We were on Nittos. Uh, it was, it was, the car was a ripper in 2013. It was just me as a driver was not evolved uh, well enough to really captivate on that. Um, so, yeah, we had a uh, fourth fourth place qualifying in Atlanta as well that year. So 2014, we knew what we did in 2013. We built a car in two weeks. We wanted to build a car that was lighter weight, stronger, um, less of a street car, like a full-blown FD car build. Uh, so in 2014, we put together an E46 chassis that is the one I still currently have. It is literally one of the best chassis I've ever driven in my life. It is insane. Um, we didn't do all that well that year. Um, we did some average driving. We were dialing in the car and working on a lot of new things that we did that we weren't ready for. Um, but we finished pretty much every round and we ended up qualifying second in New Jersey and I won the Formula D Hardest Charging Driver Award. So that was cool. At least my efforts were, or didn't go unnoticed. Uh, 2015, same car, a lot of uh, changes in the off season. Um, still on the BMW power plant, about 750 wheel. We started implementing nitrous. Um, but we had a new tire that was less superior than a lot of the other ones. So we finished top eight in uh, Wall and qualified sixth at Irwindale. Um, overall, I think we finished like 15th or 14th. Um, wasn't a super great season, but we were still trying to figure everything out. And I had a new team and we we're trying to make it all work. Um, in 2016, um, we, I spent a ton of time in the off season to make my car an absolute machine, upgrading everything to titanium, super lightweight, everything. Um, we had the car down to 2650 with me as a driver, um, which with FD is insane because we have to have quite a bit of safety equipment, fire suppression, all that stuff adds up. Like we have a hundred pounds in safety equipment and extra stuff in our car. So with everything said and done, 2650 was insanely light. Um, so we were still on a lesser superior, less superior tire, uh, but we had it dialed in perfect. Like the car was absolutely a machine. And I had figured that car out to a T in 2015 and it was time. So in 2016, we started off at Long Beach and we had won the event with no one more times, no nothing. Um, we just pretty much just slaughterhoused it. Um, I, and then throughout the rest of the season, I think we blew a motor at every single round. Um, we were knocked out because of mechanicals at every round. The car was just too gnarly for the budget that I had. And even though we tried to turn it down and figure it out, we were just, we were fighting battles that we didn't quite understand. We would turn the power down and build the motors crazier and it still would fail the same thing. So later we found out what it was and it ended up being the Venus issue where we were spraying nitrous while Venus was being activated and ended up being cylinder pressures through the roof and splitting blocks and heads and gaskets and O-rings and stuff. So we figured it out, but it was a little bit too late. Um, I even swapped an LS1 in at the end of the season to try to help, and I had an injector fail in the LS and melted it down. It's terrible. Um, but anyways, worst season of my life that started off with a high point and ended up being me just absolutely, like, killing myself trying to keep the car running so at the end of 2016 i went to vaughn i was like hey i'm driving for you next year how do we make this happen and uh we worked together and made an awesome plan and really it worked out to be a dream come true i know i've told you guys this a bunch of times but 2017 rtr gig solid the car ran great everything was perfect it allowed me to as a driver to uh excel so much faster and learn so much information that it was just insane to me. We qualified first at Wall and Irwindale. We had a few top eights, but it all just got better. It was 32, top 32, top 32, top 16, top 16, top eight, top eight. So it was just progressing. And I know this year we can be in the top eight every round and hopefully get it on the podium quite a few times. So pretty cool. FD uh, gave me the best drifting style award for that year, for last year. Or so it was pretty solid. I mean, it made me feel like my efforts did not go unnoticed and, uh, that's voted on by the peers and uh, by the fans, so it was pretty cool to win that. So, anyway, so now you guys know a little bit uh, of the background of myself and uh, what I've been doing driving-wise for the last 15 years now. 
going into my seventh season in Formula D and my 15th year of driving, which I'm going to be 30 this year. So that's pretty much half my life. Um, but yeah, let me know what you guys think. Um, you can definitely Google any of these events and whatnot and see some of the driving and some pictures and video of uh, what was happening. I definitely would say watch this video as you're loading up some of those videos and just kind of check out what was going on to kind of see a little bit of the history of it. I wish I could do that, but I don't have a week to edit this video. <laughs> I just wanted to get it out to you guys um, and have it more raw because that's what I'm about. You can always do all the research on the back end if you guys would like. Don't forget the Stanford Answer Contest and giveaway. Um, that's going to be March 4th at midnight. The, it, would all, it will all end, and we will pick a winner on March 5th and uh, hopefully get it announced March 5th they, by the end of the day, but it might end up being like uh, March 6th before we actually are able to announce the winner because we have a really cool way of being able to pick it at completely random that involves the car and some wild stuff. So it should be cool. Um, thanks for all the support, dudes. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, like, comment, subscribe, tell your homies about it. Let's build this channel up so I can get you guys some more content and uh, do some cool stuff. We have so much cool stuff that we're doing, it just doesn't end up making it on here because it's, it's so much budget to try to get it shot and edited and put up and, and to you guys. So let me know what you guys think. Later, guys.